Now that I'm used to the climate A thing that if man ever found A place to live easy and happy That Eden is on Puget Sound Eden is on Puget Sound That Eden is on Puget Sound A place to live easy and happy that Eden is on Puget Sound. Hello, you are listening to The Seattle Files. My name is Chris Allen, I'm your host. On each episode of this show, I get together with a different local comedian, and together we discuss the strange, unusual, interesting, and oftentimes lesser-known aspects of our local history. Joining me today on the program is Anthony Householder. How's it going, Anthony? Hey, uh, it's good. It's going really, really well. Started off with a... With a... Anyway, yes, I'm doing great. Awesome, <laughs> great, cool. Uh, Anthony is a local improv and sketch comedian. You can see him performing regularly around town, kind of a home base at the Pocket Theater up in Greenwood. He performs in the groups uh, Sober Virgin, God Bless Ya, Kangaroo Court, and uh, some other uh, miscellaneous performances you can catch him in. Uh, anything I'm leaving out? No, no, that's it. You nailed it. Awesome. Uh, how long have you lived in the, in the Northwest, in the Seattle area? My whole life. Really? Yeah, okay, Yeah, cool. the furthest away I ever lived was um, Bellingham for two years. Okay, Western? And- Nope. Uh, I after high school, I had a couple friends that went there, and so I would go up and visit them, and I just I fell in love with it. So I just moved there for a oh, couple cool. years. Yeah, it's a great place. Yeah, yeah. Oh, actually, real quick sidebar. I I actually lived in Oregon for three months after Bellingham, and when I was there, I lived with a member of the Israel family. I was listening today to your podcast. I was. Uh, uh, just like doing my homework a little bit, preparing myself. I've listened. So love is your like, love is your yeah, family. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. And so I, uh, I won't say their names or his name or anyone's name involved, but I know like three of the kids. Okay. All around, probably thirty years old. Uh, and it took me ten to fifteen minutes in the podcast. Once you started talking about the culty aspect of things, mm-hmm. I was like, oh my god, this. Family is like that notable that they like, yeah. Okay, were they were they super friendly and polite? I've uh, heard I've heard that the children are just like wonderful, delightful people. It uh, it it varies. Okay, yes, all right, yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but it's yeah, they. Uh, I en- I enjoyed all of their company. The three that I've met. Okay, cool. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Very nice. So you, your whole life, you're from the city itself originally? Renton. Renton, okay. Uh, or uh, anyone that's from Renton. Renton. Renton? Yeah, Renton. Yeah. Uh, yep, I, I lived there until I was like 22, then Bellingham, then down to Oregon for three months, and then uh, up here I've lived in the city for three years now. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, how much do you know about local history? Uh I would say slightly more than average, uh, the person living in the city, mm-hmm. uh, above average for someone living in Florida. Uh, okay. <laughs> I, uh, yeah, I, uh, I, I've like, I, I mean, I'm not that well informed on, uh, history in general or even current events, but like, you know, I, I was raised going to school with taking Washington state classes yep. and, yeah. uh, I took a history of the Pacific Northwest class at central Seattle community college Oh, okay. or Seattle central community college, but, yeah. uh, and which was interesting, but I, uh, I would, there's a good shot. I will not know anything about the story we're about to talk about. Okay. So, and you don't know what we're going to be talking about now, no, correct? No, no, Awesome. No. Well, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, David Swinson Maynard was born March 22nd, 1808 in Vermont. He trained as a medical doctor and in the 1830s took charge of a medical school in Ohio. Uh, He was more of a humanitarian than a businessman and was known to give extended unlimited credit to his students and forgive patient debt. Wow. Yeah. So a teacher and a doctor. He's a teacher and a doctor. Well, he's he's running a medical school. Oh, okay. He's kind of an administrator, teacher, doctor. Got it. He's kind of doing it all. Uh, but yeah, he uh, is not. Uh, he's not the shrewdest of businessmen. Sure. At this point, so sure, he's right. just humanitarian. Kind of, yeah. Vibe to this guy already. Okay. Yeah, he just wants to help people. David something Maynard. David Swinson Maynard. All right, I'm a fan so far. Yeah. The medical school went under during the Panic of 1837. So he loses his medical school. What's the Panic of 1837? It's a stock market crash. Oh, great. there's a bunch of panics over the sure. over the over the years, uh, and so people lost all. All their money in the stock market. Stock market plummeted. The economy tanked. David Swinson and, uh, out of yeah, the school. He loses his school. 
Uh, he had sponsored projects for many friends, and after the stock market crashed and they were unable to repay their debts, he went thirty thousand dollars into debt. And this is eighteen. This is eighteen thirty-seven. Thirty thousand okay. dollars. So he's eighty million dollars in debt. <laughs> Something like exactly. that. Yeah. Okay. Multiply that by about <laughs> thirty or so, sure. and that's what it would be today. So a lot. Uh, he spent the next 12 years doctoring, scrimping, and saving while trying to get out of the hole. Because he's really, really in debt. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, he and his wife Lydia had two children. And he long suspected his wife of infidelity. Oh. Um, but he caught her in the act. Wow. And made the decision to leave Ohio and head out to California. Wow. Yeah, the 1849 gold rush had just started, and thousands of men and women were moving west, and he decided to join them to see if he could make a fortune on the frontier. Wow. Yeah. So he's, he's going for it. He's going for it. Yeah, yeah. he's a, a doctor, and his he lost his medical. Or he lost his med school. His wife's cheating on him. I love he's it. Like I'm getting out of here. It's funny now that you mention it. It's almost the same as like someone getting accepted to Harvard. There is still the gold rush going on. It's just whenever someone decides to become an actor in L.A., you still go to oh, California. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you're like I'm just gonna. I got accepted to Harvard and it, it like full ride. But you know what? I'm gonna go be an actor instead in L.A. And that's what this is my view of david Maynard all right, right this now. is if you were david Maynard, yeah. this would be your <laughs> yeah, experience yeah. <laughs> except you didn't go to harvard and <laughs> right not and in it LA was right never now, even so. close to accepted <laughs> all right uh in 18 april 9th 1850 doc maynard as he was known to be called at age 49 set out to california so 49 years old Jesus. starting over yeah. yeah in the again in 18 1850 is That's when he's like... leaving that's yeah. like, you, you're, you've got 20% of your life left. Yeah, that point. if that. Yeah, yeah in 1850. Whew. Yeah. Um, he was planning on connecting with an old friend, Colonel John B. Weller, who had already made the trip to California. Um, and he would travel most of the way on the infamous Oregon Trail, which in total would shepherd approximately 400,000 people to the West Coast. Oh, over the course of... It's an entire in, in its life, yeah. yeah in its fifty, if, yeah. sixty year life, yeah, four hundred thousand people. Yeah. Did you ever play the Oregon Trail? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 You ever make it to the end? Yeah. Yeah. I don't think times. I ever did. Yeah. I don't think I did. I yeah. played a lot though. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you know uh, Jim Stewart Allen? The guy who puts on the show at the yeah, pocket? Yeah. yeah. Uh, Jim Stewart, he's a comedian. He's been on this, this show before. But he uh, does Oregon Trail. He plays Oregon Trail and talks about it live. Yeah. And he streams it now online. You can check out his Twitch channel. Oh, he channel. still does that? He still does it. He, I think he does it every day. That's great. Yeah. <laughs> every like, day. Every day at like 4 <laughs> o'clock, he, uh, he'll, you can, if you go on his Twitch channel, it's like video game online thing, um, you can watch him play Oregon Trail and talk about the history behind the Oregon Trail. It's really neat. It's, that's great. It's such a niche thing. Yeah, that's great because I have never seen it, but it's like local legend for comedians in Seattle. Like every single comedian has heard of this show yeah. that he did because mm-hmm. everyone loves it. Everyone, everyone, loves, everyone loves Oregon Trail yeah. and Jim's the sweetest guy. Yeah, yeah but yeah. yeah. Cool. I'll check that out. Uh, he rode a single gray mule and took a buffalo robe, some books, medicine, and surgical equipment. He had very little wow. money as he was still in debt, but planned on selling his services as a doctor in order to finance his journey. Cool. So he's like, I'll treat people all along Love the way. It. Yeah. I'll make my money doing that. Yeah. On a gray mule. A gray mule. That's... Doc Maynard in a gray mule. You, how can you with... not root for this guy? Yeah. You know? He's like humanitarian, gets cheated on after going into debt. Yep. And then he's like, you know what? Fuck it. I'm going to do, I'm going to go for it. I'm yeah. going to like play the lotto. It's never too late. Yeah. 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 Uh, in St. Joseph, Missouri, he joined up with a wagon train and became the team's doctor. So meet some people, he says, let me team up with you, I'll be yeah. your official doctor, and, and we'll all work together. So this is truly like the video game. This is exactly yeah. the video game, yeah. <laughs> uh, the deadliest, most common disease on the Oregon Trail was cholera. Daily, he and the wagon train passed fresh graves of cholera victims. Ugh. Dysentery was the big one trans- uh, programmed at the computer game, but cholera was the, was the big killer. Yeah. On the actual trail, yeah. The bigger than... Well, bigger dysentery, dysentery killed a lot of people, but yeah. cholera was the number one killer on the Oregon Trail. Okay. He contracted cholera on May 29th, but was able to nurse himself back to health. Uh, cholera causes vomiting and diarrhea until the sufferer becomes dehydrated, dehydrated. and dies. Same as dysentery, right? Yeah, Isn't it's, it's very similar, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, he would treat people by constantly hydrating them, as well as giving them laudanum, which contained opium and made the person constipated. If you're constipated, oh. you can't, which is why opium was such a great, one of wow. the reasons it was such a great medicine, is because wow. you wouldn't poop yourself to death. No shit. Yeah. I wonder, yeah, was that like uncommon knowledge to use opium to 
to constipate no. yourself. That's why they did it. That's why. Well, that's one of the reasons opium was such an effective method for on on the frontier. Yeah, was okay. dysentery and cholera get constipated. Okay, that's what I'm wondering. If he was like some genius that was like, I know what I'll do. No, I'll constipate them. Because I he what, did he did have some really uh, controversial ideas at the time, like washing your hands. <laughs> and using like clean water to, uh, which is one of the reasons he was such an effective doctor. Yeah, is because uh, there, people didn't do that, and people didn't know that. Uh, I read an article by a uh, doctor in, I think it was the late 1700s, early 1800s, and he was saying it's an insult to ask doctors to wash their hands because doctors are gentlemen and gentlemen's hands are never dirty. Wow. And so he was just railing against this idea that doctors should wash their hands. Which was is totally true. I mean, those were the good old days. <laughs> yeah, back exactly. when gentlemen were gentlemen and... Uh... That's so unfortunate that we've fallen so far. Yeah, like, right? Like, sure, the death rate is lower, but at what cost? You yeah, know, You should exactly. really ask yourself that. Um, Less people die, but where is our dignity? Where, where have all the cowboys gone? I don't know. Yeah. Where's my John Wayne? <laughs> Where's my prairie song? Uh, June 7th, 1850, he wrote in his journal, Start late. Find plenty of doctoring to do. Stop at noon to attend some persons sick with cholera. One was dead before I got there, and two died before the next morning. They paid me $8.75. Deceased were Israel Brochiers and William Brochiers and Mrs. Morstan, the last being the mother to the bereaved widow of Israel Brochiers. We are with five or ni- with e- we are within five or ninety miles of Fort Kearney. I feel like if you were to flip through every page of his journal... Aside from the names, it would just be exactly the same entry every day. Like, kind of. There's woke a lot. up, everyone's dying. Yeah. I tried to fix them. I, I only picked out a couple of things from his journal, but you are exactly right. <laughs> is past cholera gaze, past cholera gaze, yeah. past, past a river with a, a marker in it that said cholera on it. And yeah. Yeah. Uh, that, but pretty much. Pretty how, did, uh, how did most people contract cholera? I don't know how that works. Through exposure to feces and things like that, uh, through unsanitary conditions, okay, and okay. the trail is not a sanitary place at all. No. So through through contracting, uh, you contract cholera through exposure to feces and sure. not washing properly. And sure, yeah, which was hard to do. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay. Yeah, all right. Uh, the following day, June eighth, left camp of distress on the open prairie at half past four in the morning. The widow was ill both in body and mind. I gave them slight encouragement by promising to return and assist them along. I overtook I overtook our company at noon twenty miles away. Went back and met the others in trouble again. I travelled with them until night. Again overtook our company three miles ahead, made arrangements to be ready to shift my duds to the widow's wagon when they come up in the morning. So he hasn't slept in two days. He's traveling back and forth between the two wagon trains, and he is now abandoning the train that he has been on and been the doctor of in order to be the head of the wagon train of uh, this the, these people who have just died. Oh, wow. So he's taking the, the widow whose husband has just died. He's attaching his stuff to her wagon, and now he is joining up with them. Okay. Okay. Does it say – I mean, I'm unclear. Does it say why – he changed wagons essentially. Like, was it? Was he needed more, or did he like fuck this wagon? Like, they're a lost cause. Well, he was into the widow. Oh, yeah. Okay. Uh, Got it. Yeah. So it's not clear at this point. He doesn't really say, but it becomes clear later on that he was into the widow. Okay. Um. It's yeah. It's 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 a weird situation. Sure. But it also might have been. You know, we just lost all these people. Can you come join up with us? We really need a doctor. But that might have been part of his motivation Bonus, as well. my husband just said. Yeah. 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 Uh, Doc Maynard decided not to go to California, but instead to join Catherine Brochier's The Widow and her wagon train on their trip to the Pacific Northwest. Uh, they were headed to Tumwater on the southern tip of Puget Sound, where Catherine's brother, Michael T. Simmons, had become the first American to homestead on Puget Sound. So, I, just, I just missed maybe a plot point. Is this, in this moment, he decided to not go to he's California? He's not going to California. In this okay. He's, t- he's hooking up with the wagon train that Catherine Brochiers is on. Okay. And he's following them up to the Pacific Northwest instead of going to California. Wow. Yeah. Change, change of plans. Change okay. of plans, okay. yeah. And it's very clear at this point that he's not so much going to California as he is leaving Ohio. Yeah. He just wants to get away from his debt and his failures and his sure. failed marriage and wants to get out of there sure. and start over somewhere else. And now he's like, okay, well, California, whatever, I'll, I'll go up to the Pacific Northwest instead. Okay. Uh, I, I wonder if your debt, if I, and this is a stupid question probably, but does your debt 
I'm sure it does, but I'm, I'm just picturing, does your debt follow you from Ohio to Washington? Yeah, like, you, you would know? still be in debt, Yeah, but you would be outside the law to an extent. Right, exactly. I mean, wh- uh, this is a part of the United States at that point, but it's not a state yet. Yeah. It's recently been annexed. I'm just picturing, um, I, I, it's so hard for me to imagine how they keep track of all, all that stuff, you know? Like, yeah. Like, who's in debt to who, especially when you move away yeah. in this time period. Anyway. And at that point, you one. could just say, I'm someone else. <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> you, no one would ever find no. you, ever. No. Ever, no. yeah. 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 Okay. Well, that's one of the reasons, uh, interesting, we were talking about Hollywood in LA, uh, and, and moving out there. Um, that's one of the big reasons is that the movies started in, California is because Edison had uh, copyrights on all filmmaking equipment and projector equipment, and so oh. they moved out there because they were far enough away that he wouldn't. It was unenforceable on the other side of the country. Interesting. Yeah, and they could get around the copyrights. There was one episode you had where you talked about two small time movie makers and like the two of them like going to battle against each other. Maybe it was Stage. Uh, it was Stage. Pant- yeah. Pantages and Considine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Pantages. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, and uh, you, you ended this by saying so they were gonna ford a river or something. Uh, yeah. So they're either gonna pay the ferryman to go across the river right. or ford the river. Right. Always pay the ferryman. Always. 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 Uh, so the Oregon Territory, he's always heading up to the, uh, the Pacific Northwest. The Oregon Territory had just been established as an official part of the U.S. in 1846 and comprised of modern-day Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and western Montana. So it was one big – the Oregon mm-hmm. Territory was one big chunk sure. of land. Um, Maynard got – had gone from having one mule to being in charge of a wagon train of five yoke of oxen and two yoke of cows. Damn. And the wagon train was also incredibly sick and had lost seven members in the last two weeks. Wow. Yeah. I don't know how many are left, but seven people in two weeks is a lot. Yeah. In the land of the Oregon Trail, a doctor is fucking king. Yeah. Pretty you much. Know? Yeah. 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 Doctor with opium. Doctor with opium. Yeah. The next several months were rough. More members of the team died, as did their animals. Maynard wrote in his journal, quote, kept guard for fear of Mormons. (laughs) Really? Yeah. Mormons are out in Utah. They've gone out and settled, and they're very territorial. Because they've been driven out of the East Coast. And so they've traveled across the U.S., and uh, there there was a lot of fear of Mormon attacks and Mormon... I don't want to dive too into this, but why were the Mormons driven out of the East Coast? Uh, a variety of yeah. reasons. Okay. Yeah, right. uh, Joseph Smith was seen as a cult leader. Oh, right. And they Which drove him out. True. And yeah, he uh, was accused of a great deal of uh, sexual impropriety with ah. underage women. Okay. Um, and so they were heading out west to the Promised Land, and Joseph Smith died. He was killed. And uh, Brigham Young took over, and then they ended up out in Utah. Okay, cool, <laughs> cool. Yeah, but they're 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 Mormon settlements in Utah, and they're very territorial. Okay, and they don't want they don't want to be messed with. They don't want to be reckoned right, with. Right, right, because they just got they, kicked out of their home. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, they arrived at Simmons's home, who was not happy that his sister had left home with her husband and was arriving with a different man who was married. It became clear that Maynard's interest in Catherine had taken a romantic turn. Simmons tried to persuade Maynard to continue on his trip down to California. Uh, He's like, hey, thanks for getting here. You are going to California. Maybe you should continue on that way. Yeah. 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 Wait, and this is not her... Wait, who's this person? This is Catherine's brother. Oh, it is. Catherine's brother, Michael Simmons. Got it, got it, got it, got it. Oh, man. Uh, They arrived at some... Oh, yeah. Uh, There we go. The coastline had been charted, but the surrounding areas had not. Uh, Maynard ventured north to scout on the rumors that there were massive coal deposits that could potentially be mined. He settled on Bud Inlet in a small town called Smithter. Smithter would later be renamed Olympia. Also called Smithfield at the time, it was named after Levi Smith, who died in the area while having an epileptic seizure in a canoe. Not a good way to go. No. No bueno. The Wait, er- he, I'm sorry. He left her? He's just like, okay, you're right. I'm leaving now? No, Maynard, Maynard is still in the area. He's okay. in Bud Inlet, very close to where Maynard is living, or where uh, Brochiers is, Catherine Brochiers is living. Yeah. Uh, and he is going and scouting the area and seeing what kind of financial opportunities he might be able to. Okay, but make. still staying like But close still, to still her. in the area, sure. still in the Pacific Northwest, yeah. yeah. yeah uh, the area was sparsely populated with settlers, and he was not able to support himself as a doctor, so he started chopping wood. 
And a year later, he had cut, alone with an axe, 400 cords of wood. A uh, cord is four feet high, four feet wide, and eight feet long. Yeah, yeah. So 400 cords. That's uh, football fields. In the fields. course of a year. In the course of a year. Jesus. Um, he got the captain of the ship, Franklin Adams, uh, Captain Leonard Felker, to ship the wood and himself to San Francisco, where he made $2,000 for it. Okay. That was pretty good money back then, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He briefly considered staying in San Francisco, uh, as was the original plan, but after treating four gunshot wounds in two days, he opted for the peace and quiet of the Northwest instead of a violent mining town. Because the gold rush is oh. still raging, oh. and he's thinking, I'm, maybe I'll go down and sell this wood in San sure. Francisco, I'll stay down here, and yeah. then he treats, he sees four people in the area were shot within two days, yeah. and he's like, oh, this is not, I don't want to be here. That's interesting, because it's, uh, I mean, for him, no pun intended, it is a gold mine, because... He he can easily work as a doctor. Oh, that's right? true. I mean, and he yeah, and he just says no. I would rather, even though that's the reason he came out was to like make money, and he clearly could. Yeah, he still is like this is too, too hot, too violent. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah you can't you can't spend money if you're dead. <laughs> Using the two thousand dollars, he bought up trading. Uh, he bought up trading goods and returned to Smith to open a trading post. At his trading post, he undercut his competitors and extended unlimited credit. He was also a heavy drinker and became even more generous when intoxicated. <laughs> this guy. So you get trashed and just, like, give people stuff. He's, he's and... multifaceted. He's a complex he's, man. Yeah, he's a complex else, guy, like, yeah. Like, to, to come down after being a doctor at 49, right? Yeah. And then at 49, 50 maybe by now, you chop... 400 quarts of wood in a year? Yeah. Did I get that right? So 400? 400 quarts, yeah. In a year? In a year. At 50. At 50, yeah. This guy is... He's tough. He's, he's fucking, tough. He's pretty badass. He survived the Oregon Trail. Yeah. yeah. Uh, he met Chief Seattle, who convinced him to move his trading post north to the mouth of the Duwamish River, across, from a, um, across which, on a small peninsula, a group of settlers had established a settlement they were calling New York Alki, which meant New York in a little while. Alki was a Lashutsi word that meant, oh. like, by and by in a little while. Hmm. Uh, and Alki uh, is later been anglicized and is now pronounced Alki. Oh. And that's where we get Alki from. Interesting. Alki point for New York Alki. So Alki Beach, at the time, they said, they, like, Babe Ruthed it. They pointed their bat and they're like, we're going to be New York someday? Yep, pretty much. The, yeah. ter the Terry brothers were two of the settlers that said, we're going to call this place New York. Oh, man. Because it'll someday be New York. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, yeah, that, that was the first... The first settlement was built of on Elliott Bay was built uh, on the on the um, uh, Alki Point. Wow, cool! Uh, the settlement was five months old and had seven men, five women, and twelve children. Led by Arthur Denny, the group was known as the Denny Party, which oh. is why we see Denny's all over the place in sure, Seattle. Sure, sure. Uh, the Donation Land Claim Act in 1850 stipulated that any single male American citizen who was at least 50% white could claim 320 acres of land in the newly formed American territory if they were to homestead on it. And married couples of the same requirements could claim 640 acres or a square mile. What was the name of the act? Uh, the Donation Land Claim Act. So anyone that says, I want to settle here. Yes. They, do they have to purchase it? No, it's free. What? Yeah, you can come up because they the uh, we had just become a part of the United States in 1846, and yeah. they wanted American citizens to move out here. Okay, and so it's part of it is um, so we this becomes a part of the U.S. in 1846. The Mexican-American War ends in 1848. Mm -hmm. When the Mexican-American War ends, what is now uh, California. Uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Texas, Oklahoma, all of that becomes a part of the United States. Now, that is all below the line where slavery is acceptable. So there's a concern that if California, Arizona, New Mexico, Texas, all of those become states, they'll all get Senate seats, they'll all get congressional seats, and those will be slave-owning states that have political power. Uh -huh. um, so to try to counteract that, they're trying to get northern expansion to come over in order to get American citizens to move out here, in order to establish political, uh, uh, to like a political to balance. counterbalance. Yeah. yeah. So Northerners are trying to get American citizens to come out here to populate this land yeah. uh, as a countermeasure to all these southern states that all have the potential to become slave-owning states. So when you say they, you mean specifically the people that already live here and are trying to, like... 
When I say they, I mean northern uh, uh, states on the on the east coast. Yeah, are, want want more northern states. And what about more... like what about the president? Like at the time, was he interested in in this as well? Was he part of this push, or was it just like the uh, the Oregon Territory people? Uh, it, well, no, it was, it was everybody who was abolitionists on the East Coast okay. wanted American citizens. And a lot of people, uh, Daniel Bagley and Thomas Mercer, that's the reason that they came out here is because they were abolitionists and they saw it as their, um, uh, uh, sacred duty to come out here and populate this land in order to fight slavery. Nice. That was one of their methods of, cool. of fighting slavery. So it really yeah. depends on which side of the abolitionist argument people were on as to whether or not they wanted people to come out here. But that's one of the biggest reasons why... Sure. This why they wanted to give this free land opportunity. Yeah, and and going back to one particular note on that act, it's like it, which is horribly fucked up by today's standards. But it yeah. was if you were at least fifty percent white. Yes. You so they were sort of. I'm sure. Well, they wanted back then that was like as well, liberal as you could get. It was yeah. They, it, that was progressive for yeah. the time, but they also wanted um, white. Americans who had moved out here and intermarried with the local population, mm. they wanted their children to be able to claim land as well. Ah. Um, so, so that's, it's that's more, of a Native more that's more what it was about. Yeah. yeah. Not, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. History is really racist. Oh, fuck and really, yeah. and also like oh, there's, there's God. already been people living out here for 12,000 years or longer. Um, yeah. So it's, it's, yeah, but basically, uh, the Denny party comes out for this free land. And now Maynard, since he's coming out here in 1850 or so, he can claim land as well. So, uh, oh, yeah. these people We're are all, about Maynard. these people are all <laughs> claiming land out here. Okay. Um, he, Maynard could not have been more different from the Denny's who were pious men and women didn't drink and were staunch Republicans. Uh, Maynard on the other hand, was a hard drinking Democrat. Okay. So he was, uh, yeah, he, he, he and I know there's kind of me, I like it, Occasionally, this changes what it means to be a Democrat and a Republican. Pretty much very, very unrecognizable from today's. Yeah. Unrecognizable. The Republicans were northern abolitionists. The Republican Party was formed specifically yeah. to, to abolish slavery. Yeah. Okay. That was That's originally be my question. stated. Yeah. And then the Democrats were all in favor of states' rights, and the states' rights at the time was for slavery. Man. So Southern Crazy. Democrats were the ones that were trying to secede because they felt that their state's rights to slavery was being infringed upon, which led to the Civil War. Um, and then everything kind of reversed and changed in this yeah. weird way. Uh, yeah. Uh, Republicans were also always pro-business, but in the early 1900s, pro-business meant big government because they wanted infrastructure. They wanted railroads. They wanted... Uh, power companies, they wanted all kinds of stuff in order to aid business. Then once that was already established, they wanted a smaller government to uh, get out of their way. And then everything really changed when a Democrat in 1964, Lyndon Johnson, signed the Civil Rights Act and all of the racists fled from the Republican par- from the Democratic Party. And, so uh, funny. It just yeah. how, how, how often our parties contradict themselves when you look at it historically. Yeah, it's yeah. Funny. It's weird. It, the changes, I mean, when we talk about Democrats and Republicans back then, we are not at all talking about the Democratic right. and Republican Party today. Yeah, exactly. Not even close. Uh, anyway, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, a clerk in Olympia called the settlement Duwamps, uh, it being home of the Duwamish people. Huh. But no one really liked that name because yeah. it's not a great name. Yeah. Uh, so Maynard persuaded them to name the town Seattle after the chief. Maynard did? Maynard did. Wow. Yeah, so he said, let's call it Seattle. This guy. Man. Yeah, yeah. Huh. Uh, the other other settlers also agreed to shift their land claims to the north and allow Maynard to claim a land uh, claim the land to the south, where Pioneer Square and the International District are today, much of which was south of that were tide flats that would be covered with water when the tide came in. So everything south of about Jackson Street, down like where the stadiums are, those were all tidal lagoons. Oh. That were underwater when the tide came in. Okay. Back then. But he has a, he has a big, his land claim is on the south side of that. Everybody says, okay, we want you to come in. We'll shift our land claims around and, uh, and you can take that land. The reason it's not like that anymore is just because we built above that, right? Or did the tides actually? Succeed? No, they, they filled in that land. They, yeah. They used, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. all artificial land. Yeah. That's what yeah. I thought. Okay. Uh, he opened his general store, the Seattle Exchange. Um, he hired natives to help build it, clear the land, and catch salmon he would smoke and sell. 
When other white people came along, he would try to convince them to settle there, believing the town had a promising future but needed people to make that dream come true. He would clear land and sell it as cheap as he could on the belief that the more the town grew, the more his remaining property would go up in value. Which is smart. Yeah. He said, we have all these services and all these businesses here, then the land that I keep will become more more valuable. valuable. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Henry Yesler was one such visitor, looking for a place to build a sawmill. Doc Maynard and Carson Boren agreed to shift their land claims and let Yesler have the property he had already cleared if he were to bring the mill to Seattle. And the mill was built on the site of what is now the Mutual Life Building in Pioneer Square, which is the home now of Magic Mouse Toys across the street from the Pioneer Square totem pole. Okay. So it's right, that that, that building there, that it's like a rose-colored building, is the original site of the sawmill. So they had a sawmill right there. Was it? Did it say whether or not it was successful? Sawmill? Yeah. Sawmill was incredibly successful. Killed it? Oh okay. yeah. There's a whole. You want to learn more about that? There's a whole episode about Henry Yesler. Okay. But without the sawmill, Seattle would not have become the city it is today. It was also the first steam-powered sawmill on Puget Sound. So the sawmill really brought in oh, money. It, it brought in it. Yeah. jobs. It, yeah, yeah. The sawmill was incredibly successful. <laughs> cool. Very very lucrative. Uh, Maynard sold a piece of land to Captain Felker for $20 on the promise that he would build on it. He gave two acres to Methodist missionaries on the promise they would clear and develop it. Uh, He built and operated a blacksmith shop until an experienced blacksmith came along and he sold it to them for $10. So he just wants businesses. He just wants people to be moving here. He wants this to become like the downtown area. I'm not trying to get ahead of the story. I'm just curious if I've missed something at this point. Has he been appointed to some sort of like, like, uh... I don't know the word I'm looking for, like governmental. Not like, yet. Yeah, Not yet. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So he's just doing this just because? Just because. Yeah. Just because. He, like, he wants to help build. Maybe yeah. he sees some profit. Oh, he in sees it profit himself, in it for sure. For yeah. But he wants, yeah, he wants to build up the area. Yeah. Okay. He wants to develop the area. During the first few years in Seattle, uh, he would paddle down to Olympia to resupply and visit Catherine Brochiers. In Olympia, he would persuade anyone he could to come and settle in the developing town. In October 1852, Maynard became the Seattle delegate to the Monticello Convention in what is now Longview, just north of the Columbia River, near Kelso, Wa- Kelso Washington. Um, so, the yeah, uh, Longview, he goes down to this convention. The northerners of the Arizona Territory wanted to break off and become their own territory, uh, and the territory would go from the border with Canada to the Columbia River. So they want to break off from Oregon. Okay. And they want to form two separate territories. And the last bit, like two minutes ago, did you say that he uh, and Catherine, what did he do? Did they... He goes down and visits her. Oh, that's, that's it. it. That's it. Oh. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. More importantly, he's a, <laughs> did you say he's a delegate? He's a delegate okay. to the Monticello Convention. So discussing breaking off and forming a new territory as a subset from the Oregon Territory. Okay. And they wanted to call this territory Columbia. Oh, um, okay. Yeah. The Oregon Territory Legislature agreed and made Maynard's store, the Seattle Exchange, the official residence of the county seat and him justice of the peace and notary public. Um, he, justice, sorry, that's a long title. What yeah, does that mean exactly? Justice, Wait, just, of, justice of the peace. Uh-huh. He can perform weddings. He can. He, he's, he's basically an official. He's not quite like the mayor, but sure. he's a... Uh, he can perform official ceremonies. He can, yeah. like, uh, be an arbiter between disputes. Okay. He can do all kinds of stuff. As okay, a sort of a jack of all trades. Yeah. Like, hey, with the city slash state thinks highly of you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, he also filed for divorce from his wife, Lydia, oh. which was granted by the territory legislature. So he's out here, and he's still married to Lydia, but he files for a divorce. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, the territory was separated March 2nd, 1853, creating two territories, the Oregon Terry to the south, which included present-day Oregon and southern Idaho, and the newly formed Washington Territory to the north, which would include present-day Washington State, northern Idaho, and western Montana. The name Columbia was dropped because there was concern that it would be confused with our nation's capital, the District of Columbia. Uh. Representative Richard H. Stanton suggested they named it after George Washington instead. That's so ironic. It is the worst <laughs> idea it's, imaginable. It's so ironic because in in an event, oh god, it, or it, with the intent of of not confusing it with Washington D.C. Every time we say Washington, we People have think to clarify. Washington, yeah, Washington State. Yeah, because nobody calls it the District of Columbia. No, if we were called Columbia. 
there would never be any confusion at all. No, no. But because it's what we now call that Washington, D.C., and not the District of Columbia, yeah, it's it's asinine. Yeah. It's such a dumb idea. So yeah. thanks, Richard H. Stanton. <laughs> but to be fair, I mean, if you were to say, to say today, I'm going to Columbia, people would be like, you're going to the store where they sell outer, like, yeah. outerwear goods? Oh, you're going to the South American yeah, country? Yeah, so maybe, you know, he knew. No, yeah. no, this is terrible. This, it's ridiculous. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's absolutely terrible. His divorce final on his return north, he stopped in Olympia and asked Catherine Brochiers to marry him, which she agreed to, although her brother Mike Simmons had threatened to shoot him if he called again. Hmm. Uh, the two were married at a farm near Olympia. Upon returning to Seattle, Maynard officiated the first wedding in Seattle between David Denny and Louisa Boren. Uh, Maynard and Arthur Denny disagreed on how the streets of their new city should be laid out. Denny thinking that they should run north-south, and Maynard believing they should go parallel with the bay. An agreement was never reached, and they each built streets according to their own wishes. Oh my gosh. (laughs) And as of today, the streets still hook at Yesler Uh. Way, where Bourne and Maynard's properties met aside from a sliver of land that belonged to Yesler. Wow. Yeah. So after, That's why we're so fucked. Well, after the fire, uh, they straightened out the streets more. They made okay. them connect better. But that hook, if you're going down south on First Avenue, when you hit Yesler Way, you know how the street kind of hooks a little bit to the right? Yeah. That's because when they first built the streets, they did not agree on which way they should run. Yeah. So that's there's a sliver of land that's kind of that's Yesler's that goes up Yesler Way, but uh, other than that, the two land claims that's about where the divider is. Yeah, and it's already a hard city to put streets on anyway because of the water and the way that it's shaped, and also the hills, and the hills that go up. And yeah, yeah. The hills are a big thing. This isn't that's not really the reason we have such bad traffic today. It's the land features. The land features right. are really the killer. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that makes more sense. Uh, yeah. Didn't we flatten a bunch of this land here, Oh, too? Yeah. 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 There's an episode on the Denny Regrade, yeah, okay. uh, if you want to learn more about that. But yeah, a lot of Seattle's topography uh, really does not look at all like it did yeah. initially. Yeah. Uh, Isaac Stevens became the Washington Territory's first governor in, in 1853 and named Mike Simmons as special Indian agent, who in turn recommended Doc Maynard to be the Indian agent for the Seattle area. Uh, the Indian agent was something of a liaison between the natives and the settlers. Maynard already had a good relationship with the native population. He had learned how to speak Chinook, which was a trade jargon, something of a mix between English and Lachutseed. Uh, he, he, and he and Chief Seattle grew close, the chief saying, My heart is very good towards Dr. Maynard. Hmm. When Chief Seattle gave his famous speech in the presence of Governor Stevens, he did so in front of Maynard's establishment, Doc Maynard having arranged the meeting. I gotta say, the only person it seems like that doesn't like Maynard is Catherine's brother for some reason. Oh, she hated he hated him. That's yeah, weird. for sure. Why? You know, because he she, Maybe. she she I think he sees him as an opportunistic lech kind of. Sure. But he's also I mean I think he's warmed up to him a little bit because now he's recommending him to be the Native American agent or the Indian agent. Oh. Uh, so Simmons was the one that recommended Maynard to be oh. the Indian agent of the Seattle area. Okay. So yeah. all right, he finally took. He's warmed up a little bit, yeah. Well, they're married now, so I think things are a little different. Okay. Uh, Maynard also arranged the meeting at the signing of the Point Elliott Treaty, in which Chief Seattle and a number of other chiefs signed away their rights to the entire Puget Sound Basin, two million acres, to the U.S. government. So he's really the he's 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 the intermediary between the native population and the whites. Wow. Uh, in return, the natives would receive $150,000 payable over 20 years in goods and relocation to reservations in exchange for surrendering all this land. It is generally agreed upon that the natives who signed were not fully aware of what they were signing or what implications it had. Yeah. Skirmishes started breaking out between natives and settlers. Tribes began raiding settlements. Maynard and Catherine took in children orphaned by the raids. He was given instructions to take all friendly natives and escort them to the other side of Puget Sound. Uh, Maynard paid out of pocket for the expenses to shelter over a thousand natives to the peninsula and chartered a schooner for their goods, knowing what would be the only place that they would be safe. Wow. Yeah. Going back to his humanitarian ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah trying to help help these folks because uh, he sees the writing on the wall and everything's about to hit the fan. But he was the one that also mediated this shitty 
treaty, right? Or, or well, he was he like a, more of a translator. He was more of a translator. He arranged the meeting place for them, and okay. it's really Isaac Stevens was a pretty terrible guy, um, but he was viewed as a moderate because a lot of people were advocating extermination instead of relocation for the native populations. Oh, um, so it's that like. It's it's horrible by today's standards, but then he was considered somewhat progressive in that. It's a yeah. it's a oh, it's a history is on this weird sliding scale. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ugh, it's hard. Yeah, uh, Chief Seattle warned Maynard of plans to assassinate him. Um, for a time, he took off his trademark dark suit and wrapped himself up in a blanket to blend in with the natives. January twenty second or January twenty sixth, eighteen fifty five, Maynard stayed with the natives in Suquamish during the Battle of Seattle. From across the waters, they could hear the warship Decatur firing howitzer shells into the woods as natives sat, sat on the outskirts of Seattle. Two settlers were killed, and hundreds of natives died in the attack. After the Battle of Seattle, Maynard was no longer a welcome figure in Seattle. Um, he was viewed as an Indian lover, and many felt he could not be trusted. Tensions were rising in the, to the east, and the Civil War was looming. Maynard again found himself at odds with the Republican majority in Seattle as he was a Democrat in favor of states' right to slavery and Southern secession. So Maynard's pro-slavery, oh, yes. or he's pro-Southern secession. Even though he is the Indian agent, and he's a liaison, he's a, a friend of the Native populations as much as he can be, he is still pro-slavery and in favor of the South. Damn it, Maynard. It's this weird... Yeah, it's... it's He's a strangely complex man. Yeah, yeah. Fuck. Yeah. Okay, so... So it's, it's weird to... It's hard to form an opinion on him. Yeah. You know? I mean, obviously, he, he he's advocating for this horrible, horrible thing. Slavery is horrible. And Civil War, the South, you know, trying to secede so they could have slaves. Yeah. Or but, they could maintain slavery. Yeah. And it's, this is the same guy who's paying out of pocket to personally ferry... Yeah. People out of harm's way. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Yeah. Shitty. Yeah. Um, he traded 260 acres of his uh, land claim for a 319-acre farm on Alki Point, but farm life didn't suit him. He went away on business and returned to find his house burned to the ground. Maynard abandoned the farm and returned to the settlement to build Seattle's first hospital. Maynard remained close with Chief Seattle and his family, um, including his daughter, Kika Soblu. Catherine one, one day said that she was far too pretty to have a name like that and decided that her name should be Angeline instead. So Kikaso Blue is still known today as Princess Angeline. Ugh. And that's a really shitty thing to yeah. say to someone. Like, yeah. oh, you're too pretty for the name that you have. Yeah. I'm going to call yeah. you this other thing instead. But everybody now knows Princess Angeline. Yeah. Everybody's heard of Princess Angeline. But yeah. Kikaso Blue, is, is, which was her actual name. Which is, yeah, I mean, I don't even need design. to say it, which is more than fine name, which is, it's, uh, yeah. it's god damn it, god damn it history. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, after a time, Lydia, Maynard's first wife from Ohio, received word of the official divorce and decided her children grown to head out to Seattle. The donation land claim that Maynard had acquired uh, his the uh, on, through which Maynard had acquired his land stipulated that single men claim 320 acres of land and married couple 640. So when Maynard divorced Lydia and married Catherine, he transferred the land claim to her. And Lydia was trying to get restitution for the land claim she had been divested of in the divorce. So Maynard came out. He said, I'm going to claim 640 acres of land because I'm a married man. Mm. But now I'm divorcing my old wife and marrying my new wife. So I'm mm. going to transfer this property into my new wife's name. Okay. Um, but Lydia could not have granted claim, been granted claim to the land because she never lived on it. There was the stipulation you had to homestead on that land. Yeah. So Catherine was stripped of her land because of the time she moved on to it, the law had changed slightly, and a large portion of the land reverted back to the United States government. Which at this point, I mean, enough people are here maybe at this point that it's like they're not so free, like freely giving it away. Yeah, they'd yeah. stop. The, the donation land claim back only, only lasted a couple of years. Okay. Uh, yeah, but it's so he, he, because he tried to... Claim land that his wife never lived on and then transfer it to his new wife after the laws had changed, the U.S. government re revoked the land. Uh, Maynard, who had been licensed to practice law by the territorial legislature, tried to fight it but was unsuccessful. Um, an outcast in the city he'd helped found, he drank more and more until his death in 1873 at age 65. 
His funeral was the largest Seattle had known at the time. Uh, one in attendance eulogized, quote, Without him, Seattle will not be the same. Without him, Seattle would not have been the same. Indeed, without him, Seattle might not be. Wow. He was the first person to be buried in Lakeview Cemetery on Capitol Hill, and his grave is at the highest point on the property. So you go to Lakeview Cemetery, go to the very highest spot, that's where Doc Maynard is buried. Wow. So, at 49, he leaves Ohio, yep. goes on the Oregon Trail, yep. saves a bunch of people, transfers wagons, falls in love, decides, I'm not going to California anymore, up to Washington. And then from there, over the course of 15 or less years, he helps found the he city. He founds of, the city of Seattle. He'll yeah. the city of Seattle, Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Or this Never city. his intent when he left. Never his intent. No, he just yeah. wanted to leave. He was unhappy in Ohio, and he yeah. wanted to leave. Um, and he ends up doing all of this stuff in Seattle. And even though he was a humanitarian in a lot of ways, he was also a proponent of slavery. Sure. Um, it's, it, yeah, it's, uh, he's a complex figure. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. A problematic figure. Yeah. Huge contributions to building the city that it is. Uh, he would have been an advocate for Indian rights, but there's this other side of him that yeah. you know we we can't ignore. Yeah, yeah. And I I don't. It's it's the question of how much how much can we forgive someone for deplorable views based on the time in which they lived, and I don't have a good answer for that. Yeah. Um, I mean, we could be purists and say anybody that does not have modern progressive views should be dismissed out of hand. Right. But, or we could forgive anything that was a commonplace view at the time. Yeah. Do you, but, like, which lens are you viewing it under? I mean, through, uh, th somewhere through the middle. Right. Somewhere that's through, what I'm saying. Yeah. yeah. It just yeah. depends. And that's tough, you know? And it's it's tough to say how good he would have been like if he had shown up after all this stuff had already happened in Seattle would he has been as been so like would he have been such a good por person towards Native Americans because I think the reason he started talking with them initially was for business yeah and, that's and true he uh, like and it's it appears as though he fell in love with them because he got to know them and and did things you know selflessly to help save some of them. But, you know, it's just, you know, that's tough. Yeah. Yeah. So you be the judge, listener. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for listening to the Seattle Files. Thank you, Anthony, for being thank here. Thank you for having me. This was great. Oh, good. If you have a topic suggestion you'd like to hear an episode about, shoot me an email at theseattlefiles at gmail.com. Like us on Facebook. Subscribe and rate in iTunes. Uh, to support the Seattle Files, go to patreon.com slash theseattlefiles. Thank you for listening. We'll be back next Tuesday with a new topic and a new guest. The 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 new topic.